I, I love teaching on women of the Bible. I find a lot of inspiration from them. I find when I dig into the depths of who they were and what the story means, it ministers to me on a great level. And one of my very favorite characters in the Bible is one that, that really you don't hear a lot of messages on, but she means so much to me. And it's, um, it's Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And that's where I'll be taking my text from today. Let me, let me set up the text for you before we get into the teaching. Is There's actually two anointings of Jesus. One happens in the early part of Jesus' ministry. That's recorded in Luke 7. And then there's another anointing, which we're going to be talking today, that's recorded um, in Mark 14 that actually happens at the end of Jesus' ministry. And this anointing, the first anointing, was by a woman that's just called a sinful woman. A lot of people think that maybe it was Mary Magdalene. She's not mentioned by name, but, but that's where our mind is led to believe. But this anointing is by Mary, the same Mary that loved to sit at Jesus' feet, the same Mary that had been uh, present when Jesus raised her brother Lazarus back to life just a few weeks before this event. This event actually happens on Tuesday of Holy Week. On Sunday, Jesus will make his triumphal entry. On Monday, Jesus will clear the temple. This event happens on Tuesday. We don't really know what Jesus did on Wednesday. Nothing's recorded of that day. On Thursday, we will have, he will have the Passover. We call it the Last Supper. And then the Garden of Gethsemane, his arrest. On Friday, he will be crucified. And this event happens in a town called Bethany, which is a suburb just outside of Jerusalem. And with that, to set up the text, let me read or follow along with me as we read our text from Mark 14. It says this, While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignant to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured her perfume on my body uh, beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today, and um, we, just, we just love you. We thank you for loving us, and we thank you that when you were knitting us together in our mother's womb, you already knew us by name. Father, I thank you for this opportunity and this chance to speak, and and I, I understand what a privilege it is. And may I say exactly and according to what you've called me to say. Father, we would be remiss if we thought this was a happy day for everybody. Mother's Day is sometimes a painful memory or painful thought to those whose mothers are no longer here. For those that didn't have the relationship with their mother that they've always wished they had. It, it's a painful time for those that wanted to be a mother and have longed or longed to have a baby in their arms, but that just wasn't in your will. So I pray that you come in a way today that we understand how good you are and how much you love us and, and we'll come to this place to hear your voice and you will speak. I pray, Father God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. I pray that you will come and speak 
and it's in your name, Jesus, the name above every name, the name that every knee shall bow, that we pray. Amen. Now, there are three things I believe that we can learn from this text. And the first is this. She did what she could. Can you say that with me? She did what she could. She didn't do more than she could. She didn't do less than she could. She just did what she could. I believe that there's a problem in the world today, and it, it seems to be, uh, I used to think it was just in America, and then I went to the Dominican, and I realize now it's everyone. There's a problem with low self-esteem. There, there's a problem with people that, that don't feel like they fit. Is there anyone here besides me that never feels good enough, pretty enough, thin enough, or smart enough? Is there anyone else that ever feels that way? And what we've done is we've allowed other people to define us, the things that were said about us as a child, our failures, our successes in the past, and we've allowed people in the media and the world to define us and tell us who we're supposed to do, supposed to, what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to be. And because of it, we never feel like we quite measure up. We feel like we're never quite enough because we've allowed all of these things to come in and try to squeeze us into a mold that was never made for us. We've done all those things except for looking into the mirror of God's word and finding out what he says about us. I, it was a Saturday morning not long ago, and um, I still had my jammies on, and, and I walked by a mirror, and... My first thought when I walked by the mirror was, when did my mother come into this house? <laughs> Has anyone else become their mother? Come on. <laughs> Which is a good thing for me, but it's just shocking when you realize that's what you've become. My second thought is, when did I get so old? Have you ever just looked at yourself in the mirror and thought, when, well, what happened here? And, and I looked, and I, I thought, I know why old people go to Florida for the winter. Because everything else has gone south. They might as well go there in location. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And fat, saggy, looks better tan. I, I really do believe that. And, and then I realized that it was my hair. I, I needed it colored. And as when I was looking to see, I thought, you know, I don't even know what my original hair color is anymore. <laughs> and then when I, I get done doing this, I realized that the skin underneath my arm was still going. Does anybody, do you have that, anybody? Am I the only one? And then I saw it. Then I saw it. A hair that I thought had fallen off my head. It was attached to my chin. I think you have enough to worry about getting old. You should not have to worry about hair growing in strange places. Can I get an amen to that? And men, don't be so smug. I've seen the hair that now grows out of your ear instead of the top of your head. And Bill walked by, and he saw me. And I said, have you, have, this just didn't happen overnight. Have you seen this thing? I said, look, look at how old I am. I said, I really think I need to buy some more turtlenecks because it's turkey season and somebody's going to shoot me with this thing I've got going here. I said, can you tell me something positive about myself? Can you tell me something that would make me feel better about myself? And he looked and studied it for a minute, and he goes, well, your eyesight's still good. <laughs> and when I stopped to look in the mirror, I thought the reflection was true, but it wasn't truth. The reflection was true. I'm getting it old, but that's not who I really am. That's not the truth about who Love Lockman is. Let me tell you who I really am. I'm a child of the King of Kings. That makes me royalty. And if you belong to God, that makes you royalty too. Would you turn to the person and say, Hello, I'm 
and say prince or princess so and so it sounds quite nice i'm not kidding i'm i teach junior church so i'm being serious go ahead it sounds nice Now let's see your, your wave, your royal wave. Now some of you need to do this. I spoke once at a retreat in northern Ohio and the homecoming, one of the homecoming queens from college came up to me when I was done speaking and she said, well, whoever thought that Love Gray would turn out? I said, well, whoever thought you'd be fat? But I didn't. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but I did say God did. Because before the foundation of the earth, he knew me by name. He knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And every flaw and imperfection that he allowed to be in my life was there so that anything of beauty or value, God would get the credit you see, the reason a lot of people battle with low self-esteem is they're living up to a standard that they will never meet because it's been put upon them by the world. You were created for a purpose. There's a reason you're alive. There's a reason you're still alive. There's a reason you're in the world. And he has called you to be what he has called you to be, not what everybody else is calling you and telling you to do. What he has called you to do is what you can do. What is your purpose? Why are you here? You find that out. Then the sense of confidence comes over you because it doesn't really matter what everybody else counts on you for because you know you're doing what God called you to do. Can you feed the hungry? Do you know one, one in four children... In Indiana, go to bed hungry every night. There are people that are deciding between whether to buy medication or food. Can you afford to buy some extra groceries and give those to one of our uh, food banks? Can you clean out your closet and get rid of some of the clothes you will never fit into again? and give those to the clothing center. And do you know what the number one request of the clothing center is? New underwear. And when the lady told me that was the number one request, I said, uh, as in the opposite of you take old underwear? She said, well, we like to give new underwear. Can, can you, when you clean out your closet, go by Walmart and buy a pack of underwear and put that with the things that you're giving? Can you do that? Can you buy a shoe, a $10 buys a shoe for a kid in the Dominican Republic? And in the Dominican Republic, if you don't have a pair of shoes, you can't go to school. And so children there are not getting an education because they don't have a closed toe shoe to wear. So you're not only providing a pair of tennis shoes, you're providing an education. Can, can you be an encourager? Can you write a note? Can you go visit a nursing home? What can you do? You see, because when you find out what you can do, not what everybody else tells you you can, you please God. You see, when Mary was willing to just do what she could, it ministered to Jesus. And when you learn to just do what you can, you minister to Jesus. The next thing I believe we can learn from this is she not only just did what she could, she was willing uh, to sacrifice. Now the scripture tells us that this perfume was more, worth more than a year's wage. Now if you think about that, think about what you make in a year, what you live off of a year. And that's how much this perfume cost. Now, that's a big deal for anybody. But for a woman in Jesus' time, this, this was her nest egg. This was her most prized possession. Because women during Jesus' time, the only way they had to support themselves without a man in their life was either through prostitution or becoming a beggar. So this was what was going to take care of Mary. This is what she was depending on. And let's face it, Lazarus' health hasn't been that good because he just, Jesus just had to raise him from the dead not long ago.
So she, this was her most prized possession, and she gave it to Jesus. What's your most prized possession? Oh, if you're like me, it's probably not a thing or something material. It's someone. It's someone that you, you give to God or something that, that you know you need to give to God. In fact, you often pray this prayer, Lord, please, please, you've got to do something, whatever you need to do, but you always find yourself taking it back. There's a great scripture in 1 Peter 5 that says, cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. And the way the word cast can be defined was different in the Greek than what I thought of cast. When I think of cast, I think about going fishing and you cast a rod and uh, cast the line on the water. You cast the net. And I realize that's pretty much how I do my problems. I, I go, here they are, God. Please do something. But when God's ways aren't my ways and his times aren't my and my time, I always seem to reel it back in. And then I'm like, okay, God, let's try this. You know the way the word cast can be defined in the Greek? Violently hurl. In other words, give it to God in such a way that you couldn't take it back if you wanted to. That's what he desires from you. When Billy was starting kindergarten, uh, before school started, we went to Kmart to start that important shopping day. You know how it is with children. They give you a list of all the things you have to have uh, for back to school. And like I say, with your first child, you want to be sure you have everything on the list. By the third child, you're with like, oh, let's wait a few weeks and see what they really need. But that, that first kid, you really want to impress the teacher. And so we had bought the right scissors and the right papers and, and the right markers. So it had taken quite a while. And so the boys had been relatively good for Billy and Andy, and so uh, they had asked when we checked out if they could have a quarter for uh, the gumball machines. And I said, sure, if, if you'll continue to be good, if you'll continue to be patient, I'll give you a quarter. Well, the girl was checking me out, and it was taking a little bit longer because there was each separate items, and, and Billy came over, and he goes, Mom, you need to come quick. And I said, just a minute, Billy. He goes, no, Mom, I mean it. You need to come now. I said, Billy, he goes, Mom. And I turn around, and I see a really strange sight. I see Andy, who was three, and he was bent over the gumball machine. And I looked, and he had his chubby little arm up inside the gumball machine. And I went over to him, and I said, okay, no gumball for you, fella. And so I tried to remove his hand. His hand wasn't kind of stuck in the gumball machine. It was totally wedged up in the gumball machine. Well, I, I can't get him out, so I go over to, to the cashier, and I said, can, can you please help me? My son is stuck in a gumball machine. And she's frustrated because I'm holding up her line. So she gets on the loudspeaker and she said, Would the manager please come to the front of the store? We have a boy stuck in a gumball machine. <laughs> well, I don't know how educated you are about gumball machines, but they had to call somebody from the other side of Chicago to come to this Kmart. And so while we're standing there, uh, Andy begins to panic. And he keeps looking down at his hand, and, and he keeps looking at me like, I'm going to wear this the rest of my life, aren't I? And I'm looking at him like, eh, I don't know how I'm going to get a t-shirt over that. I, you know, it doesn't look good. And, and uh, then Billy is, Mom, would you make him be quiet? Everybody's looking at us. Mom, Mom, can we just leave him? I said, we can't, we can't just leave him. He said, he can't go anywhere. Wait, you can come back later. I so I don't know what else to do. So I say, okay, we're going to pray. And so, I mean, we can't go anywhere. So Billy grabs Andy's hand. I grow, grab Billy's hand. And then I put my hand on top of the gumball machine. <laughs> and I pray, Lord, please help the man to get here quickly with the keys to the gumball machine. Please help Andy to calm down. And please help Billy to be patient. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Andy calmed down. Billy calmed down. 
The man finally got there with the keys to the gumball machine. And when they did, they had to totally disassemble the gumball machine. And when they did, gumballs began to roll all over the floor. And here is Billy. <laughs> stuffing his pockets. And when we got down and all the gumballs were gone, that's when we saw it. Andy's hand had a gumball in it. The gumball technician, or whatever you call them, pulled this slimy, sweaty, nasty gumball out of Andy's hand, and Andy released his hand. Then Andy put his hand back up. The technician put his slimy, sweaty, nasty gumball back in Andy's hand. Andy popped it in his mouth, and we were free to go. I learned an important lesson that day. When Andy released what was most important to him, he not only received freedom, but he re received the very thing he thought he couldn't let go of. You see, not only did he receive freedom, but he received the very thing he thought he couldn't let go of. What's your gumball? You can trust him with it. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, immeasurably more than you ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within you. You can trust him. You see, when Mary just sacrificed, she ministered to Jesus. The third point is that you got to be willing to be criticized. Now, when you read this text, it, this part of the story really gets me. Because who criticizes her? When you read the parallel Gospels, the stories that are in the other books, you, you fully get who criticizes her. It, it wasn't the Pharisees. They, they criticized everybody. It wasn't the non-believers, because the truth is the non-believers loved Jesus. You know who criticized her? Her disciple, the other disciples. Her brothers in Christ, they had been there. They had seen her set at his feet. They had been there when he had raised her brother Lazarus back from the dead. They knew how much she loved him. And they're the ones that criticize her. Have you ever had that happen to you? The people that should be there for you? The people that should know you're just doing what you can. The people that know that, that it's a sacrifice for you. And they're the ones that criticize you. The Bible says that they'll know we are Christians by our love. But you know what? I'm not so sure that's what the world sees in us. You know what the world thinks of us, don't you? As Christians, we're boring and bland and a bunch of hypocrites. And do you know whose fault that is? It's ours. We're the ones that have given Christianity a bad name. I've been to church services that look like they've been medicated with a sour pill. How many of you have been to churches like that? How many of you have been to churches that the only difference between its service and a funeral service was the number of dead bodies? How many of you have been to that kind of church? You know, the meanest people I've ever met have carried the name of Christian. What's wrong with that? We should be known by our love. We should let people know that, that we're for them and not against them. You see, I, I have this attitude. If you don't tip well in a restaurant, or if, if you are rude to a server, don't pray before you eat. If you've been known to use hand gestures when you're driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off, take the fish off the back of your car. If you're going to gossip or talk about the church, be careful that it's not in front of your children or in the aisles of Walmart where somebody can just walk by. You see, we have come to this 
thing in our society, in our world today, and Satan has done a great work on us, we begin to pick at each other and we begin to fuss with each other and we're fussing within families and churches are fussing within each other and all the time we're fussing, we forget that there are people all around us that are going to hell and we're so busy fussing that we've missed who we're really about. We've missed that people need Jesus. We, we've come into this theory that it's us against them. It's the Christians against the non-Christians. It's the church against the lost. And, and we've gotten this theory that, that we don't have anything in common, so we can't relate to them. Can I tell you, the Bible says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of this dark world. Our battle's not against one another. It's not even against the non-believer. Our battle is against darkness. It's called Satan. It's evil. There's a battle between good and evil. There's a battle between light and darkness. And we need to figure out who we're really fighting against, where the battle's coming from. And when we can define this isn't them, this isn't that, it isn't all of the things that are happening, this is an attack from Satan, then we can put our armor on and stand and say, no, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, and no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and all those who rise up against me shall fall. I have um, something some people have seen. And... Um, a lot of people just think maybe it's, um, they picked me at a bad, got me at a wrong time. But I, I have a character trait that I've had since I was a little girl. Um, and the character trait is I can be easygoing, fun-loving, but you'll see a special kind of crazy if you mess with mine. You'll see something ain't so pretty if you mess with some of the people I love. Now, does anybody else have that character, or am, are you just judging me? Okay. Okay. Well, a lot of people think it's just um, something that I developed as a mother, um, or something I developed when I got married because I'm that way with Bill and I'm that way with my kids. But the truth is, I, I've always been that way. My sister and I are complete opposites. I mean, a lot of you don't know my sister, but you couldn't find two sisters that probably were more opposite than my sister. She's three years older than I, and she was prim and proper, and she liked to wear dresses, and I was a tomboy. I hated dresses. Um, she could sit still. I, ADD, couldn't sit still. She could get really good grades at school and like school. Me, not so much. And um, we, we were just so opposite. We didn't have anything in common except I had something that I knew would bring us together. The only way she would talk to me or about me was if I would just pester the heck out of her. <laughs> and so that was my mission in life, just to pester her to death. And I was quite good at it. Well, because she was three years older, it was her responsibility for me to go be sure keep an eye on me on the way to school and on the way home. And that was no easy task because I would, <clears throat> I would run ahead of her and, or I would lag behind. And my favorite thing was there was a group of friends that lived in our neighborhood and we all walked to school together. And they were mostly her age. And my favorite thing was I found a place beside a bunch of, a row of bushes that I could sneak into. And if I could catch a lizard, we grew up in Florida, I could get those girls right when they came by and jump out with this lizard and see those girls run and scream. So that was, if I could get a lizard, I knew it was a good day. So um, 
Now you see why I'm such a good children's pastor. Okay. So um, I, 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 would, I was never quite with the group because I was either behind or in front. And, but I noticed that there was a group of, I was in first grade, she was in fourth, and there was a group of sixth graders, that boys, that would meet us right on an intersection on the way home, and their goal was to bully this group of girls. And because I was either behind or ahead, I wasn't, uh, I was never, you know, I didn't get, receive any of the bullying. But for some reason, they started picking my sister out of the crowd. And of all the girls, they would pick on my sister, Elvina, and, and they were unmerciful to her. And she would go home crying because of these bullies. So this went on for several days, maybe even a week. So I came up with the plan. I had, on my way to school, I had found a nice sized stick and I put it back behind the bushes. Well, on the way home, I ran ahead and I hid in my spot right there where the bullies always came, where I usually jumped out with lizards. And, and sure enough, there were the bullies. And sure enough, they started in on the girls and specifically my sister. And when they got to me, I came out of the bushes, five years old, with this stick over my head, and I started screaming like a mad woman. And I started flailing my arms back and forth, and I started yelling, you better leave my sister alone. I mean it. And the boys, these big boys, ran and scrammed because this little kid was going nuts in their presence. Well, one of the boys fell to the ground and I jumped on top of him and I had my stick and I'm like, I mean it. If you mess with my sister again, you're going to have to answer to me. Do you get me? Well, Elvina runs back home and she goes into the kitchen and she says, Mom, you got to come quick. Love is going to kill someone. <laughs> so... She comes out and she literally, she says she remembers this. We, it, we remember it. She pulled me by the shirt, peeled me off of this big bully. And the whole way home, I'm pointing my stick as I'm being dragged. <laughs> well, at first I was going to get in trouble for fighting. And then when the whole story came out, I wasn't. But you see... There's some of us that need to realize who our real battle and our real struggles against. Satan has stolen way too much from me. Satan has stolen way too much from you. And he's smiling while we fight and fuss and families while we fight and fuss against the, the way the government, we fight and fuss against the way the world's coming to. And yes, it's all bad and maybe there's real situations, but let me tell you who are real battles against. It's against Satan and it's time for those of us as believers to take a stand and say, this is where the line is drawn and this is mine, Satan, and I stand here and tell you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And reclaim what the enemy has stolen from all of us. It's time for us to quit worrying about what everybody thinks and how we fit in. Because you see, when Mary quit worrying about what everybody else thought and what was popular and what was socially accepted and she didn't care what anybody else said, she was taking a stand for what was right she ministered to Jesus. And when you just do what you can, not what everybody else tells you you should be doing, what you can do, when you're willing to trust him with what's most precious to you, when you're willing to take a stand and not fit into everybody else's mold and, and you quit listening to everybody and the criticism and all the fussing and the fighting and you figure out who your battle's against, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we will see that victory because he is in us. And if he is for us, who can be against us? 
Let me finish with this. On one of our trips to Israel, it was my goal to go to Bethany. It's one of the sites we always go to. And when you go to Bethany, you, they have this beautiful little church that's in Bethany. And uh, you could go down in Lazarus' tomb, and there's a little gift shop that's just right there by Lazarus' tomb. And I, I knew that we were going, and I'd been studying this text, and my goal was to save enough money that I could buy an alabaster jar with nard perfume in it. And so I'd save money. Uh, after uh, we had gone through the tour, everybody was, else was shopping, I'd gone back to the bus with my alabaster jar and the nard perfume. And when I got onto the bus, uh, the fragrance, nard is so strong. You've smelled it. We've sprayed you before, uh, different services. And, and the scent is so strong that you can, you could, when I walked onto the bus, because I'd put it on my arm, it just permeated the bus. And uh, so I'd, without even saying anything, the guide said, so you got some nard perfume. And I said, yes, I, I saved my money. And I said, it was kind of expensive. And he said, yes, but compared to what Mary would have spent, nothing compared to that. And so we began to talk about nard perfume. And, and he began to tell me that the consistency that Mary would have poured on Jesus' head would, would have been so strong that it would have permeated his hair and his beard and his clothes. And, and you would have been able to smell that with their hygiene habits of that time. That could have been smelled for weeks upon Jesus. Well, when I got back to the hotel room and I began to put my alabaster jar and nard perfume up. I could still smell the scent. And I'd been studying this text, and so I just stopped. And I thought, you know what that means? That means that this event happened on Tuesday of Holy Week. That means that on Thursday night, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when all of his friends couldn't stay awake, when, when everybody else um, was just not realizing the seriousness of the moment, and, and he was pleading and clawing the ground and asking God for not his will be done, but God's will be done. And it was his last chance to escape into the Judean wilderness and just live out a life of a man. And while he's really suffering there, he could have smelled the scent of one woman and it would administer to him. When Judas came and a fight broke out, and he was taken as a criminal at night into Caiaphas' palace before the Sanhedrin, and as, as he was standing trial for people that should have gotten it, they knew the word, they should have known, recognized who he was, and they were saying terrible things about him. And the Bible says that they blindfolded and they, they pulled, literally, we're told in Isaiah that they pulled hair out of his beard. And they would say, prophesy, prophesy, tell us if you're really God's son, tell us who struck you. And with each blow, he could have smelled the scent of one woman's sacrifice and it would have ministered to him. That night when he was put into the pit, the where prisoners were put in Caiaphas' palace before they would stand trial, Roman trial. The pit actually was a dried up well that only had a few feet of water in it. And they would lower the prisoner with ropes around his arms and they would put him down in the darkness of this pit where he'd have to spend the night. They, they say that, that the pit probably had three to four feet of water so you couldn't stand, stand up and it was stagnant, dirty water with past prisoners' filth in this water. And in the stench and the darkness of that night, reliving and feeling the kiss of betrayal by Judas, of hearing Peter say he didn't know him, bringing down curses on himself, and knowing what was lying ahead, he could have smelled the scent of one woman's sacrifice, and it would have ministered to him. When he was taken before Pilate, 
when, when he was taken to the whipping post and, and they pulled him over the whipping post and what they would do is they would tie your arms to your feet so that your back would be taunt and then they would take that cat of nine tails and each one of the tails would have a metal or rock, sharp piece, uh, a substance in it and it would just tear and shred the skin down to the muscles off of Jesus' back. And with each gasp, <gasps> He could have smelled the scent of one woman's sacrifice and it would have ministered to him. When he carried the cross, when they took him and they took him to Golgotha, to Calvary, and they laid the cross down and he laid on top of that cross. Nobody put him there. He willingly laid down his life on that cross. And they would reach out his hand and put a nail through each hand and through each feet. And then they dropped him into the ground. And with each gasp of air, the way you died from crucifixion wasn't because of the nails. The way was through suffocation because your body couldn't support your lungs and you would end up suffocating. So with the each gasp of air, <gasps> he could smell the scent of one woman's sacrifice and it would administer to him. When he looked out on the crowd... And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can I tell you something? He didn't just say that to the people that were at the foot of the cross the day. He looks out at you and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't really know what their sin is doing. And when all the world had turned away, even Father God, he said, My God, my God, why do you forsake me? The Sent of one woman's sacrifice ministered to our Jesus. Can I tell you something? When you just do what you can, not what everybody else says is expected of you, when you find out your purpose and your calling for this life, when you're willing to sacrifice and say, really, God, it's yours, not my will, but your will be done, when you quit worrying about what everybody else thinks and quit listening to the distractions that the enemy puts and makes us think our battles with each other, man, when you figure that out, you realize that your life can minister to Jesus. Do you want to minister to Jesus? He's got great things planned for you. He created you for a purpose and a reason. You can trust him. His plan's so much better than your plan. Who worries about what anybody else thinks? Just what he thinks. I'd like you to stand and we're going to pray. The praise team's going to come. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But can I tell you something? You can make a difference. You can make a difference in this world. You can make a difference for all eternity. You can trust Him. Like Bill said earlier, God's crazy about you. He loves you. If you just, if you've never accepted Jesus and what he did for you on a cross, I invite you. Bill's going to come down and stand down front. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Maybe you just, you need to pray where you're at. Maybe you can pray for the person next to you. I don't know what God's calling you to do, but he wants to use you. You can be a world changer. You can fulfill your purpose for this generation. We open up this time for prayer.
for decisions, for rededications, for whatever you need to do. Father God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that before the foundation of the earth, you knew us by name. We thank you that all the days ordained for us were written in a book before one of them came to be. We thank you that we were put upon the earth for such a time as this. And so often we think, well, I can't do that and I can't do this. And how could God use little old me? Or or I've made too many mistakes or I'm too old or I'm too young. We use all of these excuses. And the truth is you're just looking for people to do what they can to sacrifice and trust you with what's most important and people that are willing to stand up no matter what anybody else says. That's the people you use. And that's how we minister to you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for giving it all for us. Help us be willing to give it all for you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.